Established in the year 2020, the ESCP Global Reach Committee is committed to promote collaboration in research and also education among colorectal societies at an international and also global level. To achieve this goal, the committee had already organized two educational webinars and a scientific symposium within the ESCP annual scientific meeting last year. In these webinars, we were able to connect thousands of surgeons over the world to exchange scientific knowledge and also experience. Feedbacks from the attendees of these workshops and webinars were very encouraging. On 19th of March 2021, the ESCP Global Reach Committee is going to organize our third educational webinar entitled Translating Evidence into Practice. Now in this webinar, there will be two topics for discussion. The first is about the controversial management of asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer in the presence of unresectable metastases. And the second part of the webinar will be ESCP Charles Update. We have invited principal investigators of various international clinical studies to come to speak to us, to update us on the trial progress, and to share with us experience. I'm sure you will find the program academically rewarding and also useful to your clinical practice. I would like to welcome you all to join our ESCP Global Reach webinar on the 19th of March, 2021. I'm looking forward to meeting you all online. Thank you. The 14th Scientific and Annual Meeting of ESCP in Vienna. Now, over the years, the ESCP has been very successful with increasing number of international members. The ESCP leadership feels that something has to be done to reach out to and to connect with all these global communities of colorectal surgeons and to facilitate the work of other ESCP committees, such as Research and Education Committee, in terms of international collaboration. Therefore, the ESCP leadership, you can see in this picture, Willem and also Dion, met with the presidents and chairman of a few Asian uh, colorectal societies, that is the Chinese Society, Hong Kong, and also Korean societies, and decided that a global reach committee should be established with these societies as the initial members. So the nascent Global Reach Committee was established and the first teleconference of the committee was held on the 20th of January 2020. And initially there were only four members as shown here, Professor uh, Yao from the Chinese Society, Dion from uh, ESCP, myself from the Hong Kong Society and also Professor Sok Wan Lee from the Korean Society of Coloproctology. So we were the four initial members representing the four uh, societies. So Professor Dion Morton and I were chosen to be the first co-chairs uh, of the uh, nascent Global Reach Committee. And uh, after the first teleconference, we have actually met about 10 to 11 times, also all teleconferences, to decide on the term of reference, the responsibilities of the uh, committee, and also to plan ahead, you know, different activities in terms of research and also education for ESCP. Flagship Hospital, affiliated to Capital Medical University, is also the president of Chinese Society of Colorectal Surgery. Welcome, Professor Zhang. Thank you, everyone. And secondly, uh, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Dion Morton, who is the Barling Professor of Things where, you know, robotic will be a better approach. So, so I think it is an option, all right? Depends on the situation, but TME is the standard. Mm -hmm. I can have a comment? Yes. Can I have a comment? Yes, um, as, as a standard search, you have to operate on patients with very, very low risk for local recurrence. Then you can do the TME. You have to decide and select this patient. But for the very, very low cancers, uh, their support. Now we are starting our communication between West and East uh, for the first time uh, via uh, different countries. I hope you feel like we do that it's exciting for us to benefit from the knowledge from these different continents and use that to benefit. Good evening from China. I'm Dr. Hong Wei Yao, come from Beijing Frontier Hospital. 
on behalf of Professor Dong Tao Zhang, the President of the Chinese Society of Colorado Surgery, and on behalf of the Global Rate Committee of ESCP, I'm very honored to deliver my warmest greeting to all our dear fellow doctors all over the world. The Global Rate Committee stands for collaboration, dialogue, and friendship between surgeons from the West and from the East. Every quarter, we will have a Global Rate Committee event to discuss some hot issues in the field of colorectal surgery, and you are more than welcome to watch every event. I sincerely hope more societies will join this warm family. Together, we will be stronger, and we will make this world a better place. Dear colleagues, I am delighted to welcome you to join us uh, on this fourth Global Reach webinar that's coordinated by ESCP with colleagues from across the world. Uh, on this occasion, we're going to be addressing the complex management of the primary tumour in the presence of unresectable metastases with presentations from colleagues around the world. In the second part, once again, we're going to discuss the ongoing research at ESCP, which you can collaborate in and be part of delivering. We really look forward to collaborating with you and I do hope you can attend the webinar on March the 19th. See you then. Dear friends and colleagues from across the world, welcome to the third educational webinar organized by the ESCP Global Reach Committee. My name is Simon Ng and I'm co-chairing this committee together with Professor Dion Morton. The Global Reach Committee was established to promote international collaboration in research and also education, and to connect ESCP with different colorectal societies across the world. To date, we have member societies from China, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, and also Thailand. We would like to invite more colorectal societies to join the committee in the near future. The title of today's webinar is Translating Evidence into Practice, which truly reflects the aim of the Global Reach Committee in promoting international research that alters clinical practice. There will be two topics for discussion today. The first topic is about the controversial management of asymptomatic colorectal primary and the presence of unresectable metastases. And the second topic will focus on other international studies from ESCP and collaborators that are going to have a major impact on our surgical practice. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee, in particular Dion, Surendra, and also Zhao Yuan for putting up such a wonderful program. I would also like to thank all the speakers for sharing their knowledge with us. I'm also grateful to your sponsors for making this webinar happen. So please enjoy the program. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Surend Mantu from Singapore. I'm the first speaker of this webinar and the topic of my lecture is resection of asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer in patients who have unresectable synchronous metastasis and what does the evidence say? These are my credentials and this is the outline of my talk. I'll be talking about what is this debate about? What are the current guidelines on managing these patients? What has changed since these guidelines have been published? And what is the latest evidence? And I will also be sharing the results of a web survey we conducted on behalf of ESCP's Global Reach Committee. And at the end, I'll be sharing a take home message. Now the debate is uh, for the patients who have asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer, but with unresectable synchronous metastasis. Should we do a primary tumor resection and then chemotherapy, or should we do only chemotherapy and no surgical resection at all? Now, what does the evidence recommend? Most of the current guidelines, including ASCRS, ESMO, Eureka, advise not to perform primary tumor resection in asymptomatic cases with unresectable metastasis. However, the point to note here is 
that most of these recommendations are based on nearly a two decade old systematic review published in 2012 by Sirochi et al. The conclusion of this systematic review was that PTR does not influence overall survival in these patients. But the authors admitted that it is uh, the systematic review included mostly retrospective studies, uh, which is poor quality and has significant risk of uh, bias in multiple domains. Now, what has changed since these guidelines have been published? Uh, there is a recognition that this group of patient is a highly heterogeneous group. It is not only the metastasis which affect the survival, but the location of metastasis as well as the location of the primary, whether in the colon or the rectum affects the survival. There are reports which show that patients with lung only metastasis have a significantly better overall survival rate than those with liver metastasis. And also we know that patients with peritoneal spread have the worst prognosis. So we can say that it is not a homogeneous group of patients. We have also noted that chemotherapy and immunotherapy have vastly improved over the last few decades. And we know that these patients live longer and are expected to have complications like obstruction, bleeding, perforation, et cetera. And whether primary tumor resection can prevent these complications also needs to be studied. We note that minimal access surgery and enhanced re recovery protocols have improved surgical outcomes and quality of life, which may be an important parameter to study in this group of patients, has largely been not studied. So there is a possibility that we must individualize and tailor-made the treatment for this group of patients. Now, I would say at this point of time that a blanket non-surgical approach may be questionable because we have a poor quality of evidence so far. We need high quality evidence from randomized trial and Multiple randomized trials have been started between 2011 and 2015. And most of these trials are not easy to design. And the main difficulty has been in recruiting patients to the appropriate groups. So we need a collaboration in this to get the answer. Now, I have summarized some of the important trials which are either underway or have been recently completed, like Synchronous from Germany, Cairo 4, Climate, PTR trials from Korea, China multicenter study, and the latest one, the IPEX from the Japan. And there is a point to note that some of these trials have stated quality of life as a secondary outcome in their measures. Now, I'll be summarizing briefly uh, results of two trials. The first one is the IPEX trial from the Jap Japan Clinical Oncology Group. Uh, the trial was conducted over a period of seven years between 2012 and 2019. And the main purpose of this trial was whether primary tumor resection before chemotherapy improves survival. So the primary endpoint was overall survival and the secondary endpoints were progression-free survival, adverse events in either groups, proportion of patients who underwent R0 resection and proportion of patients who underwent palliative surgery. And this is the console diagram of the trial. Um, fairly evenly matched groups with 84 patients in the chemotherapy alone group analyzed in comparison to 81 patients in primary tumor resection followed by chemotherapy group. Now, if we look at the results of this trial, the overall survival was just over two years in both the groups. There was no difference either in the chemotherapy alone or the PTR followed by the chemotherapy groups. And similarly, there was no difference in the progression-free survival at the end of the updated analysis. Now, if we look at the subgroup analysis of the overall uh, survival, most of the characteristics in this trial favored the chemotherapy alone group. And this was the take home message from the IPEX trial from Japan. The study was designed to confirm the superiority of PTR plus chemotherapy. But this was terminated early because patients assigned to upfront PTR plus chemotherapy group were found to have unlikely and improved survival over chemotherapy alone. The authors noted that 87% of the patients in the chemotherapy alone arm were able to avoid surgery entirely. And hospital death rate after PTR occurred in 4% of patients because of post-operative complications. 
However, it was also reported that chemotherapy related morbidity was higher and more severe in comparison to the PTR plus chemotherapy group. And the main message from this trial was that upfront PTR showed no superiority over chemotherapy alone. The second trial which I'm going to discuss is the PTR trial from Korea, which was published last year. Uh, it was an open label 12 center prospective randomized controlled trial conducted between 2013 to 2016. And the purpose was to assess the survival benefit of PTR followed by chemotherapy compared to chemotherapy alone. The primary endpoint was two year survival and the secondary endpoints were similar to the Japanese trial like primary tumor related complications, PTR related complications and rate of conversion to the resectable status. Again, the console diagram of this trial, um, although small numbers, uh, 21 patients uh, in the chemotherapy alone group were analyzed in comparison to 23 patients in the PTR followed by chemotherapy group. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference between the overall survival between the PTR group and the upfront chemotherapy group, although the numbers look different. But there was a statistically significant difference in the cancer specific survival rate among the, so it was higher in the PTR group in comparison to the upfront chemotherapy group. Now coming to the adverse events uh, which were reported in this trial, uh, the major complications, post-operative complications were 3.8% after PTR followed by chemotherapy versus 22.7% after chemotherapy only. Now the take home message from this Korean trial, this study was terminated early due to the difficulty in recruitment and lack of funding. Underpowered study and a short follow-up was reported PTR followed by chemotherapy improved the two year cancer specific survival. And PTR reported uh, fewer complications compared to the uh, chemotherapy alone group. And the main message from this trial was there is a marginal uh, statistically significant difference among the two groups, which may indicate a possible survival benefit of PTR compared to chemotherapy alone. But we need to take the results of this trial with a pinch of salt as the numbers were small and the follow-up is short. Now, what is the status of the other trials which are ongoing or have stopped recruitment? The synchronous trial has completed recruitment, so we are eagerly waiting for the results. The Cairo 4 trial, um, our next speaker will present the detailed results of this trial. Uh, the Spanish trial results are overdue. Climate uh, uh, from France, again, the results are overdue. PTR trial and the Japanese trial have, are the only two trials which have published results so far. And there is also a Grecar 8 trial from France, which is studying the role of PTR in rectal cancer only. So we are awaiting the results of these trials very eagerly. Now coming to the web survey, which we conducted on uh, what is the ground practice uh, on behalf of uh, ESCP's Global Reach Committee, uh, a questionnaire was circulated uh, all over the world and we got the responses which I'm going to show you now. Uh, the first question was, do you manage patients with asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer with unresectable synchronous metastasis? Majority of the respondents re uh, replied as yes. And majority of the respondents were colorectal surgeons followed by general surgeons and medical oncologists. And uh, we had a fair representation across the globe with majority respondents being either from Asia or Europe. So there was a neck to neck fight between Europe and Asia, but we had uh, replies from North America, South America, including Africa as well. And again, if we spread them across the countries, we had a fair representation over the, uh, more than 20 countries with the majority of the respondents uh, being from Taiwan, Japan, followed by Malaysia. Now, uh, we asked them, how many patients do you manage uh, every year who have asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer with unresectable synchronous metastasis? Uh, majority uh, manage less than 30 of, uh, patients, but we have uh, replies from some centers who do more than 50 cases every year. Uh, and when asked, uh, uh, are these patients routinely discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board? Majority replied yes, which is a good practice. 
Now, in your department, who takes the lead in decision making? Again, the majority replied that it is the uh, recommendation based on the uh, multidisciplinary tumor board. But some of the centers uh, are um, uh, surgeon led practice based, and some uh, may be the medical oncologist may be taking the lead. Now, coming uh, to the question, how do you usually manage these patients? Uh, majority replied that they follow systemic therapy and consider surgical resection only if symptoms with primary cancer develop. But an interesting group uh, which I have encircled uh, or uh, which I put in the red square is that some surgeons manage these patients case by case basis depending on the load of metastatic disease, which means that uh, they might be following an individualized or a tailor-made approach for these patients. Now, when we ask them what is the most important factor in their decision making, now it is very surprising that a uh, majority reported that quality of life followed by the length of survival is important in this group of patients. So uh, it, this may be an important factor to study what the patients actually want. Uh, do they want a surgery or they do, do not want a surgery? And uh, if when we ask them, do you take anything in consideration when you offer upfront surgical resection? Uh, majority replied, it does not matter. But many uh, uh, surgeons did reply that only uh, they will operate patients only if they have liver metastasis, which may be contrary to the evidence that we know that patients with lung metastasis live longer and uh, they have a better prognosis in comparison to the patients with liver metastasis. Uh, we asked them, how uh, do you think that there is a good quality evidence available to help you to decide? Majority said no. Uh, and when we asked them whether you are interested in collaborating, this was something very heartening that majority replied, yes, we are interested in collaborating to research on this topic. Now, this is the take home message from my lecture. I would uh, say uh, that role of surgery in this group of patients is still investigational. Systemic therapy is the standard of care at present. Uh, we have realized that this group of patients is not a homogeneous group of patients, but a highly heterogeneous group. So we need to tailor-made or individualize the treatment. However, more evidence is required to settle this debate. And I would say a comprehensive analysis from the ongoing RCTs may be able to provide an answer to this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to share with you uh, the Cairo 4 study. This is a study in which we studied uh, primary tumor resection in patients with uh, few or absent symptoms with synchronous unresectable metastasis of colorectal cancer. And in this presentation, I will give a brief introduction on stage four colon cancer. I will discuss the details of the Cairo 4 trial. Um, I have preliminary data from the 60 days mortality and I will wrap up with some conclusions. Colorectal cancer is obviously quite common and the majority of patients present without symptoms. Um, approximately 20 to 25% of all patients have synchronous metastases and curative options, which means rejection of both the primary tumor and the metastases is only possible in less than half of the patients. So the majority of patients cannot be cured if no symptoms, and the question in those patients is always, do we resect or do we not resect the primary tumor? In 2009, the surgeons from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center demonstrated that primary tumor resection is almost always unnecessary, and the results from chemotherapy treatment was very good. However, at the same time, we did a study from the Cairo study and the Cairo 2 study. These were two studies ran in the Netherlands where patients with metastatic colorectal cancer were treated with chemotherapy regimens. We saw that in the patients with synchronous disease, when the primary tumor was removed, the blue lines, median overall survival was much better compared to patients where the primary tumor was still in situ. So this made us think that it was necessary to perform a trial. And together with Professor Miriam Koopman, uh, we conducted a trial called Cairo 4, in which we studied the effect of primary tumor resection. We had a collaboration of 35 Dutch centers and four Danish centers. The 
trial was pretty straightforward in which we studied primary tumor resection followed by palliative chemotherapy versus chemotherapy only. And we did primary tumor resection in those cases where patients had symptoms along the course of the chemotherapy. Surgery could be performed either laparoscopically or open, and the chemo chemotherapy regimen was oxaliplatin or irinotecan combined with capsitabine and bevacizumab. The inclusion criteria was a histologically proven colon cancer, and later on we had an amendment in which we included also the high and mid rectal cancers without involvement of the mesorectal fascia. Patients had to have unresectable distal metastases, metastases. Patients had to have unresectable distal metastases and the primary st tumor still in situ. They should not have been treated with prior systemic treatment and they had to be in quite a good clinical condition with the WHO performance status of zero or one. The life expectancy should have been at least 12 weeks. The main exclusion criteria were patients with peritoneal metastases or an unresectable primary locally advanced tumor. The primary objective of the study was overall survival. And there were also some secondary objectives, which the main, uh, main uh, objectives are <clears throat> progression-free survival, morbidity and mortality in both arms, the number of patients who undergo secondary surgery, and also quality of life and cost-benefit analyses. We also had some translational research for prognostic and predictive markers. This is the inclusion line. And as you can see, we started um, more than eight years ago in uh, November 2012, and we just finished the inclusion of the last patient in January 2021. So it took us more than eight years. These are the centers that included all the patients. And as you can see, only Two centers included more than 10 patients. So the majority of the centers only included approximately one patient per year. And this was quite low. So we had some inclusion problems. And first of all, the main inclusion problem is that more and more patients are um, treated with curative options and they uh, are treated with chemotherapy as an induction to further on undergo liver surgery or uh, lung surgery uh, and removal of the primary tumor. Um, there were also a substantial number of patients that had some symptoms and either the patients or the surgeons or the physicians had a preference to treat these patients with surgery. But there was also a preference of patients to refuse surgery and to undergo systemic therapy. So <clears throat> there, uh, we think that in the future we need at least patient tailored treatment. And for this, we do need the long-term survival data of uh, the Cairo 4 study and of many other uh, randomized trials that are uh, conduct, uh, conducted. But it is also important to know uh, the early results for decision making. And this is the reason why we performed an off-protocol 60-day mortality analysis of um, the patients in the Cairo 4 study, and we used the first 198 patients for this. As you can see, 99 patients underwent surgery, but two were excluded from this analysis because they were protocol violation. Both patients um, uh, had a violation, one because he had no measurable metastatic disease and one uh, did not sign the informed consent. Um, in the lower part of the slide, you can also see that not all patients uh, uh, underwent the intention to treat uh, treatment uh, because uh, two patients refused to undergo surgery while they were randomized for surgery and another three patients uh, were uh, underwent surgery while they were included in the intention to treat chemotherapy arm. This is a, um, a slide where I demonstrate to you the uh, patient characteristics. And as you can see, it is uh, equally divided between the two groups. The median age was around 65. Um, the majority of the patients had low or um, few uh, comorbidities and the location of the primary tumor was equally divided. More than 60% of the patients had location of metastases in more than one organ. And quite a substantial number of patients had an elevated LDH, which represents quite a substantial tumor load. 
And these are the 60 day mortality results. 3% mortality in the systemic therapy arm versus 11% in the primary tumor resection plus chemotherapy arm, which is a significant difference in favor of the systemic therapy. If you look in more detail in the group of patients and looked at risk factors, you can see that sightness is an important risk factor that the right-sided colon cancers had an increased mortality, both in the systemic group, but especially in the surgery group with an 80% mortality in the right-sided colon cancers. Also, neutrophiles were important in the surgery group with 27% mortality in 60 days when they were elevated but also a low albumin was uh, an important factor in both arms with um, a significant um, a higher mortality um, in the uh, chemotherapy arm, but also in the surgery arm, mortality, mortality was quite high. Um, elevated liver function tests, so uh, both transaminase and transferase was important in the surgery arm as well as serum LDH. Uh, all with an increased mortality within 60 days in the surgery arm and not in the chemotherapy arm. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see all the other factors that we um, investigated, and they were all not significantly important for 60-day uh, mortality. So in conclusion, for all patients with stage 4 colon cancer with unresectable disease, um, Right-sidedness is important and gives an increase, increased 60 days mortality as well as a low albumin. But especially in those patients who undergo primary tumor resection, the elevation of neutrophiles, the elevated liver function test are especially patients that we need to take into account that they have a high risk of 60 day mortality. And you should question if you, do, if you should perform surgery in those patients. So the last conclusion of uh, these results that uh, made us think that if primary tumor resection leads to an improved long-term survival, it needs to be compensated this uh, early mortality and especially in the group uh, of the patients I just uh, demonstrated to you. So we need careful patient selection for primary tumor resection. Obviously we need long-term follow-up and it takes us at least one year before we have the final results. And it is important not only to, in, uh, to do the analysis of the intention to treat, but also perform subgroup analysis because patients who did not have these elevated tests, they have a very low uh, mortality in the first 60 days. So these patients might be candidates for uh, primary tumor resection. But obviously we need the final results, not only of our trial, but we have to pool the data of many randomized trials, including for instance, the Japanese trials. So I do need uh, do, do think that we need global reach uh, to translate evidence into practice and we look forward to collaboration with all the different uh, study arms. I thank you for your presentation and these are the collaborators uh, and I'd like to thank all the collaborators of the Cairo 4 study. My name is Per Lindner. I'm a surgeon at the Sahlgrenska University Hospital in Gothenburg, Sweden. And today I'll talk a little bit about our project about liver transplantation for non-resectable colorectal uh, metastasis. So, as you know, uh, colorectal cancer is a common form of cancer, both in Sweden and uh, globally. And uh, when the uh, they present uh, in 15 percent they have liver already have liver metastasis and then another at least 15 percent will develop uh, liver metastasis uh, and in Sweden we have a total of 2,000 uh, individuals that develop colorectal liver metastasis and the only uh, curable treatment uh, is to resect them or ablate uh, the tumors or combine those two methods. But the problem is that uh, the majority of the, of the patients are not available to uh, curative surgery. That could be because the tumors are growing uh, too close to central uh, anatomical structures in the liver that have to, have to remain, or that uh, there will be too much functional liver remnant left after surgery. And that is 
despite pre-treatment uh, with chemotherapy to reduce the term tumor burden, or uh, for example, portal embolization to increase the future, future liver remnant. Uh, it's still rather frequent tumors are resectable. And then the standard therapy is palliative chemotherapy. And with that, you achieve a five-year survival. That is uh, around 10%. So when you have a tumor situation, like on the left picture, it's necessary to take out the whole liver to achieve R0 resection. And then the concept is that it's possible to transplant uh, with a new liver. And this, uh, this concept was pioneered by the Norwegian group who did the Sika one study, which was published already 2013. They transplanted 21 patients that had non-resectable liver metastasis. The patients didn't have any ex extra hepatic spread and they were had a radically excised primary tumor. But it was a rather heterogeneous group. You see one of the cases on the picture in the lower right corner, rather widespread disease, and they didn't have any restriction based on size or number, and also were transplanting during ongoing uh, chemotherapy. And despite that, they achieved a five-year survival of almost 60%. And uh, here you just see the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, they should have, have been treated with chemotherapy uh, and um, it should be only liver only disease. And uh, you also see the results from this is the, the Sika one study. Uh, in red, you see the survival of the transplanted patients, and here they combine it with uh, patients from a chemotherapy study that were, uh, and they looked at those patients that could have been included uh, for transplantation, and that was uh, 47 patients, and uh, you see in the first figure uh, a significant uh, difference in survival even when you take out the 21 best out of those 47, there is a significant decrease, uh, increase in survival with the liver transplantation. So they continued and did uh, the CICA2 study that was published uh, two years ago. And uh, then they narrowed the inclusion criteria. So they excluded patients that had tumor that were larger than 10 centimeters. If they had more than 30 lesions in the liver, no, no lesions were allowed to be larger than five centimeters. Uh, they should have responded on chemotherapy and uh, they were not allowed to have progressive disease at time of inclusion uh, in the study. And with that, they reached the five-year survival of 83%, which is not so far away from where we are with uh, liver transplantation for benign uh, conditions. So in Sweden, we are just, or have just started to do the soulmate study, uh, which is the Swedish uh, study for liver transplantation for non-resectable colorectal liver metastasis. And the question is, of course, do we need uh, more studies? Well, in uh, Sweden, we have an organ deficiency and to include more uh, patients group we, that have a worse survival, we have to show that they really benefit from it. Uh, so together with, the, and also liver transplantation is a rather it's a big uh, procedure we associate it with risk and uh, cost and also lifelong immunosuppression afterwards and uh, so the surgical and uh, oncological community in Sweden felt that we need a validated randomized trial before we can introduce liver transplantation as a clinical uh, routine so this study will include 45 patients 
and we are comparing liver transplantation uh, with best established treatment. The control group, uh, tr the treatment is not specified as it can and will uh, change over time. And we hope to include all patients in Sweden and uh, uh, it will be the oncology centers that are including them, but the transplantations will be performed at uh, uh, Solgrenska and Karolinska. And we will uh, try to use uh, donors that are not utilized uh, today. And exa example of donors that we will uh, accept is older donors, uh, which we to a big part do already today. Uh, we could accept rather steatotic livers since these patients don't have, they don't have any uh, underlying liver disease, so they are rather healthy uh, when they come to transplant. We are also often hesitating with patients that have a, uh, donors that have an ongoing intravenous drug abuse, since we uh, might a little bit unsure about their viral uh, status, uh, and they, those could be accepted. And also hepatitis C patients, which we also uh, except for other indications, but main, I think we can get more patients out of donors that has a history of cancer, where we are today rather restrictive and uh, don't use those donors, even if the risk of transmission of disease is perhaps in the range of 1%. Here you see some examples of tumors that could, uh, from the donors that could be accepted, it's for example, breast or colorectal cancer uh, that have a complete remission and where there is more than five years of follow-up. Also intraprostatic tumors or, or brain tumors, but that will be up to the, uh, to the transplant surgeon to accept the donor. So uh, which patients are eligible for the trial? Well, it's adult patients. Uh, the primary tumor must have been removed by a R0 section. There should be, shouldn't be any signs of extrahepatic disease. It should be rather healthy patients. And we want to have a one year waiting time from diagnosis of the colorectal cancer to date of inclusion. They should have had a, at least a minor response on chemotherapy and are not allowed to have progress, progressive disease. Uh, and uh, also we are excluding patients with the BRAF mutation and MSI high in the primary tumor. And the end point is uh, rather standard five year overall survival, also looking at the two year overall survival and looking at the disease-free survival, as most of the patients in the Norwegian study had a uh, relapse of, of disease. And we are doing a, a health economic evaluation, looking at the quality of life, and also doing translational studies, uh, uh, looking if uh, tumor DNA in blood can predict recurrence and prognosis. And the patient flow is uh, uh, like this, that the patients will be identified at the local hospital. Then they will be discussed at the regional conference to see if to do resection or ablation. If that is not possible, and they might be candidates, we will do a small workup to see that they are fit enough to undergo liver transplantation. And then they will be accepted on a national uh, board for liver surgery. Uh, and after that, they will be uh, randomized. And this uh, initial transplantation workup is rather simple. It's uh, a lot of lab tests looking at different parameters. We're testing the virology. virology. We're taking urine sample uh, to exclude any a drug abuse, and uh, then we take a ECG and the ultrasound of the heart. Some patients with risk factors will uh, undergo more 
investigations for the heart and the lung, uh, as you see uh, on the slide. So where are we at the moment? Well, we included the first patient in December and it's still waiting for transplantation. We have a second patient in workup. We are, uh, at the moment, it's only Gothenburg that are including patients, but Stockholm will be initiated uh, next week. And uh, uh, the enrollment time is projected to be five years. Other studies that are ongoing is the French-Belgian study, uh, Trans Transmet, that is rather similar. Uh, it's also a randomized study between liver transplantation and chemotherapy. Uh, they are not focusing on marginal donors as our study. And then Norway is continuing. Uh, they are doing a randomized study between liver transplantation and liver resection for resectable patients and they are continuing with a liver transplantation for unresectable uh, patients. So uh, uh, we will hope that together with the French Belgium study, we hope to prove that uh, liver transplantation is a good option for these very selected patients. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. The management of asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer and the presence of unresectable metastasis can be quite controversial. Now, after listening to three great talks on the topic, I think it is time for a panel discussion. I'm Simon Ng from Hong Kong, and I'll be moderating this session together with Professor Farut from Thailand, all right, as, as my co-moderator. So first, can um, Farut, can you introduce our speakers and panelists to the audience? Fruit. Yes, yes, Simon, thank you, Simon. Let's start, uh, let me introduce the, let, let, do you hear me, right? Okay, uh, let me start uh, by introduce our excellent speaker you're just listening to by Professor Hans from the Netherlands and Professor Surinder from Singapore, welcome. And we also have three panelists, start from Dr. Professor Jun Watanabe from Japan and Professor Jo Yung Wang from uh, Taiwan and Professor Baek from Korea. Welcome all. Thank you very much. You know, thank you for it. Now, among our panel, I think we have the principal investigator and also co-investigators -invest, uh, from various large randomized control trials investigating the role of primary colorectal cancer resection in the presence of unresectable meds. So I'm sure the discussion will be very interesting. Now, let me begin, all right, this panel discussion by asking all the members the first question. So among the panel, who would resect? I mean, we talk about asymptomatic primary colorectal cancer, all right, and the presence of unresectable meds. So among the panel, who would resect? And why, and what is the rationale of your resect? Can we start by uh, throwing the question to Surendra? Maybe you can start your... Hi, thank you, Simon, for this question. Uh... Yes, I'm, I, I will be uh, resecting an asymptomatic primary and having presented a, a lecture on the current evidence. But I would also sound a bit of caution that uh, we should be selective in selecting the patient for resection. And also, I think uh, there is a difference between the asymptomatic rectal cancers and colon cancers. I'll be more aggressive in resecting colon cancers rather than uh, asymptomatic rectal cancer. And that, that's based uh, on the current evidence we have. Yeah, we can talk about case selection afterwards, but may I know your rationale why you want to reset? It's because of to prevent the complication or you think it can prolong survival or what is the rationale? Uh, well, uh, the evidence right now does not uh, show any benefit in survival. Right. But we know that if we remove the load of the cancer, uh, the effect of the chemotherapy may be better for the metastasis. Secondly, uh, if we uh, patient can develop symptoms or progression of the primary, and uh, uh, we can avoid that. And considering that now we have, um, you know, minimally invasive surgery, the enhanced protocols. And I'm sure they will also result in improved surgical outcomes 
if we select our patients carefully. I see. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Hans, what's your view? Would you resect or would you not resect? Uh, generally, I would not resect um, because surgery uh, was actually uh, our experimental arm. So the standard arm would be uh, chemotherapy in our country. Um, and as I showed in my presentations, there's definitely a group of patients whom I would be very cautious uh, to do a resection. On the other hand, um, asymptomatic is also uh, um, a definition that you really not every time you know if a patient is truly asymptomatic. Yeah. Uh, and, and with this, I mean, sometimes patients say, okay, it's fine, but they do have symptoms that they don't, do not always tell uh, when they're uh, with you in your rooms. So uh, uh, patients often have uh, uh, a strong preference for uh, removing the primary tumor. And I believe this is sometimes because they have some symptoms that they probably do not tell you. So uh, uh, asymptomatic is not very common, I believe. So in this reason, we do resect quite a, a few patients and it's exactly because they want to remove that uh, primary tumor. I see, I see. So, so for, for you in Netherlands, the standard is not to resect, but because exactly. you're running the chiral force, so within the trial, you will randomize patients to resect. I understand, so, okay, good. So uh, now how about in Korea, back? Hmm, I uh, would like to perform a resection, primary tumor resection for patients. You will resect, and Yon say you will resect, right? Yeah, all right, Yon say university, <laughs> university. I would like to perform the PTR for patients who have good ECUG uh, or ASA score and no carcinomatosis. Moreover, the primary tumor should be resected. To get to obtain better oncology outcomes, we need very, uh, very, very low cost oper operative complications. Resection should be also in the PTR resection area. This right. is really related to the better oncology outcomes. Okay, but that's in, in the, uh, the Yonsei's practice, but how about, you know, do you know in Korea? Other centers in Korea, are they doing the same practice? Until uh, now, there is no uh, consensus about this issue. Some, some hospitals, some university prepare the preventive section, other uh, university prepare the upfront to just the chemotherapy. So we need a uh, consensus. Okay, so now I'll get back to you because later on because it's quite interesting because I know in Korea you have run a randomized control trial multi-center, mm -hmm. okay, looking at oncology outcomes and I'll get back to you afterwards, all right, but for you, you resect, okay, I understand. So how about uh, Dr. Watanabe in Japan, so what's your view? Yeah. Would you resect or would you not resect? I used to generally perform the primary tumor resection However, uh, from uh, our Japanese uh, trial, a randomized control trial, uh, JCO 1007. So uh, I changed my practice. Okay. So now I do, don't do the primary tumor resection. Because right. the uh, JCO 1007 trial reported a, a mortality rate of 4% and mobility of around 40%, which are very high, high complication rate mm. uh, compared to the non-metastatic CRC surgery. So right. the initial primary tumor reduction with the significantly delay in introducing effective systemic chemotherapy. So that is why I think primary tumor reduction should be performed uh, with a strict indication. Right. So, so, so right now you, you don't, you think you should not resect because of the yes. JCOG study. I understand. Uh, so because resect, right. Okay. So, may, yes, maybe uh, to further the discussion, Professor Watanabe, can I ask you, is it a blanket decision that all patients, irrespective of the size of the tumor, the site of the tumor, you will not resect or you are still using a selective uh, approach in resecting the patients with asymptomatic primary, or it is just that all patients asymptomatic primary with unresectable meds, you will not resect at all. Uh, generally, uh, uh, that is right. So, but um, uh, I think you know, even if the primary region, uh, no, 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 I reject the 
uh, only uh, sympt symptomatic uh, primary uh, vision. Yeah, symptomatic, I think there's no doubt. I think the controversy lies uh, among those asymptomatic, really asymptomatic primary, whether you're going to recite or not. So based on, I think this is exactly what we're saying, translating evidence into practice, right? That's the mm -hmm. title of our symposium. So because of the Jacob study, I think um, you have changed your practice. So understandable. So now how about Taiwan? And Taiwan, what, what's your, 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 um, your practice, uh, Zhao Yuan? Okay. I, I think the, it remains a controversy issue in Taiwan. I think half, half and half. I think half a, a doctor will reset the, the, the primary tumor, but however, I did not, I don't do that. Because you know, this kind of patient, the primary goal will, will be prolong their life. So if you do the primary tumor resection, I think based on our previous study, our, our research study, we also have a similar result. There were no survival benefit and the more uh, surgical complication will occur. So actually in our hospital, so if except the patient have a strong will to reset the primary tumor, so we don't do the uh, reset the primary tumor at this moment. Okay, so, so thank you. So that's a practice in Taiwan. So now how, how about in Thailand, Beirut? In, in, in Thailand, we do not reset. We do not reset unless it has symptoms, so asymptomatic and resectable because we don't, want to delay the, the start of uh, chemotherapies. But the, the questions I want to ask the panelists and the speaker that, do we have any predictors of tumor complications, for example, perforations or obstruction during the course of chemotherapies? And anyone, any idea, any thought? Like tumor is endoscopically obstructed or the tumor with thin wall, for example? So, so it's a question about, you know, among those patients maybe undergoing chemotherapy, maybe in the trial, the, the control arm, some patients actually develop complication like in, in Jacob's study, I think, and eventually required a surgery, all right? So for is asking, uh, in particular, maybe for the Japanese study, do you have any predictors telling you, you know, which patient they are going to more likely to develop complications? Uh, 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 two more characteristics. Tumor complication. So tumor yes. complication. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that even if the primary reason is asymptomatic, so uh, uh, for patient with circumferential region, so that is too narrow uh, to insert endoscopy. So it can cause luminal obstruction by tumor progression or fibrosis from response to treatment. The circumferential region is risk to differential they are more, more risky. I, yeah. I, so so uh, how about Han, what's your view uh, based on your, your your study? Or at least you know, do you have a you know a a, a a rough guess, you know, how many patients actually develop complication during the course of chemotherapy? Well, it it's gonna be a very low number of patients, I presume. Um, so even in our trial or in the Japanese trial, we can probably not really identify risk factors for this uh, potentially complications in chemotherapy. Although this is something that uh, we need international collaboration in a few years, I, I, I hope, when the German trial, the synchronous trial, and our trial, and the Japanese and the Korean trial, where we merge the data together, and we and, and if we pull it, when, then we can probably or hopefully identify those patients who are uh, at a high risk for uh, tumor perforation or tumor obstruction. And, uh, but I, I, I don't think that with the number of patients we have in each trial, almost 100 or 150 in, in the chemotherapy arm, for instance, in our trial, uh, we cannot answer this question. Although we do see uh, some high-risk patients, as I showed you, uh, uh, in the primary tumor uh, resection uh, uh, group. So uh, this is going to be interesting for the future, to pull the data together and, uh, and identify the high-risk patients. Uh, maybe I have a question for Hans. Uh, in your trial, did you notice uh, the progression from a local to locally advanced tumors resulted in more complications in patients? Or what was the rate of progression from local to locally advanced uh, tumors? In the chemotherapy group, you mean? 
in the chemotherapy group. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have only looked now at the 60 day uh, uh, data. So um, we're not allowed to look at uh, uh, the long term uh, uh, data because this was our primary endpoint. So I cannot give you these answers. Um, the only answer I can give you is that uh, the data monetary committee did not stop the trial. So uh, apparently it's something that's not very common. Okay, maybe the other panelists can share because most of them do not resect. Do you often see progression in the chemotherapy arm from local to locally advanced tumors resulting in complications? Uh, Korea, 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 experience. Uh, Korean, uh, experience, Korean pediatric experience, we uh, have uh, about uh, more than 20% uh, intestinal obstructive complications. Right, in right. those patients, we performed the uh, operation, emergency operation in nine uh, percent patients, and uh, we uh, we performed the stent insertion for the patients about 30, 13 point patients. So I think these data uh, a little bit higher uh, in terms of post-operative intestinal obstruction complication issues. So I, th I think it depends on the duration of your follow-up, right? Obviously, if they can survive long enough, some of them will develop complication. The second is whether they have some response to chemotherapy. You know, for those primary tuber with some good response, I think tumor can shrink. So th that's my um, follow-up question to uh, Hans and also uh, Watanabe is because your, your two trials, I understand for the chemotherapy arm, you are giving uh, 5-FU based plus uh, bevacizumab, right, to all patients, all right? So now, can I ask you, you know, whether you have checked the uh, NRAS or KRAS status of these patients before inclusion, all right? Because obviously, you know, if those are wild types, these patients will be more, uh, will have more response to, uh, to cetuximab, right? So, but in your trial, you just give everyone bevacizumab. So can, can I just listen to Hans and also uh, Watanabe's view on this? Yes, um, uh, we don't uh, know. Uh, that would be called uh, in 2012, uh, the FENDA protocol uh, of this study was created. So the use of anti-EGFR therapy in first-line treatment was not common in Japan. I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically the same answer for, for us as well. So uh, uh, when we developed the trial, uh, we did not know this. So uh, we have not made any uh, change uh, in the protocol as far as uh, anti-EGR uh, FR uh, receptor treatment. So, so, so exactly. Um, I think that will have an impact on the clinical practice, you know, because right now we have got, you know, where predictive markers, much better mm -hmm. uh, targeted therapy, all right? And we've got a better endoscopic palliative measures. So, so the question right now is with all these advances, all right, do you think it is really necessary to do a primary tumor resection? That really depends on your rationale because if you've said it was one to, to uh, pro prolong survival, then I don't know, maybe, maybe for those uh, NRAS or KRAS or wild type patients, they will really have, you know, survival benefit only by giving them, you know, anti-EGFR, you know, monoclonal antibody. So, so what do you think of that? I mean, maybe back, what, what, what's, your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, your uh, question uh, would be an indication of primary tumor resection. Uh, I think, uh, I actually, personally, I prefer the primary tumor resection. However, we uh, did the indication and contraindication. Also, we it defined it the definition of prim primary tumor resection. Uh, the patient who have a good ECOG and AESA score uh, is reasonable to perform the primary tumor resection. And also, uh, we have a concern about carcinomatosis. Carcinomatosis is a totally different disease entity. This is a contraindication. And brain or bone match, this all kind of patient uh, is not uh, just a simple stage for only second. So this patient is a contrary indication of, uh, of primary resection and good ECOG and ASA score patient is an indication of uh, primary resection. Also, location is very important. Colon and upper rectal cancer could be reasonable to perform primary tumor resection. However, low and, low and 
middle rectal cancer is very challenging technical issue. So I uh, usually do not perform the, the primary tumor resection for this patient. This, so my uh, opinion for primary tumor resection, after uh, this resection to obtain the good oncologic benefits, we need a uh, precise uh, indication and contraindications. Correct, correct. Yeah, indication is important. And we talk about, you know, how you select your patients. Because um, <clears throat> we discussed about uh, tumor location like colon and rectum. Rectum will be more complicated. So, uh, 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 Watanabe, would you, would you uh, do a, in your trial, you have excluded rectum. Am I correct? In the yeah. Yes, yes. The rectum. So how about yes. Hans, Hans? And in Cairo 4, do you include patients with rectal cancer? We, we have included patients uh, who were non-locally advanced. Right. So uh, with a, uh, let's say, standard uh, TME surgery, uh, when that could be performed, patients uh, would be eligible for the trial. Okay, I see. So how about in Taiwan, Zhao Yuan? Uh, it's tumor, uh, tumor location affect the decision of whether or not to resect the asymptomatic primary? Because uh, no, the rectal resection carries higher morbidity to patients. Yeah, actually, uh, Taiwan has a consensus for the metacyclone cancer treatment. We divide the patient into three groups. The first group is clearly tender. I saw the patient just received the operation. And the other group will be the cytokine reduction. So we have, uh, so the, today we are talking about the uh, just a disease for disease control. So for disease controls, uh, every patient in, in Taiwan, we have uh, KROS, uh, NROS, BROS, uh, mutagen analysis. For patient with KROS, uh, ROS, uh, BROS, Y type, we, we divide the patient in the right side or right, left side colon cancer. And uh, for the right side colon cancer, we the patient receive a double uh, chemotherapy with the anti-VGF. The left side colon cancer, the patient with chemotherapy double with uh, plus uh, anti egfr For just a uh, ROS mutation, the patient just receive only the anti vga plus uh, and chemotherapy double So for uh, for the other group will be b mutation, the patient will receive the chemotherapy triple A plus uh, anti vgf or uh, chemotherapy double uh, plus anti vgf So in Taiwan, we have a consensus. Okay. So that's, today we're talking about just easy control. Yeah. No, it's, so that's for the metastatic treatment, right? Chemo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. About so all these are after primary tumor resection, or you leave the uh, primary. Uh, wait, I I I am talking about that. Uh, actually, in Taiwan, these are also the controversy issue. So it depends on the hospital. I I mean maybe half and half. Some doctor will receive receive the primary tumor, but other we will not do that. Yeah. Okay, I see, I see, all right. I, I, I think make, uh, make good point that we consider the difference between colon and leg thumbs and Zhao Yun say right sinus because colon on the right side and left side may be different. So uh, yeah. my question may, may be go to Hans and surrender. Did you come up across the sinus of the tumors in terms of the, the decision for the tries or the reviews? How about, uh, let's start with Hans, uh, about the sinus. About um, the side, side well, of the tumor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, um, as I demonstrated that the right-sided colon tumors have a higher risk of 60-day uh, mortality. And uh, this is actually, we know from uh, the data from our uh, National uh, Cancer Registry that uh, although we think and, and rectal cancer patients are more difficult and surgically wise, they're perhaps more difficult to treat, uh, the mortality is much lower. Uh, because we, I mean, if we are in doubt, we give them a, a, a colostomy. So the mortality of rectal cancer is lower than uh, colon cancer. And the mortality of the right colon cancer patients is actually higher than the left colon cancer patients. And also the long-term outcome is worse. So um, I would actually, although we usually think that the right hemicolectomy is the easiest operation to start with, it's, it's, the, it's the most dangerous operation actually we have in the colorectal cancer surgery. Okay. All right. So uh, that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Please. So I, I could not find in the literature that uh, the decision can be made based on the side of the tumor, but what has been said previously, the fitness of the patient, the size of the tumor, 
uh, no local invasion and easy resectability are most of the uh, people use these criteria for making a decision whether to resect or not to resect now since the um, you know this um, topic of stoma formation has been brought in uh, can i ask the panelists does anybody look at the quality of life we give to these patients you know uh, how many patients i'm sure none of the patients prefer to have a stoma one of the advantages of the primary tumor resection is to resect without giving a stoma to a patient whereas when they live longer especially with our current powerful chemotherapy they are, we are bound to see more and more patients with complications especially local complications like obstructions or local invasions when they will need a stoma in future uh, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on this on the quality of uh, what the patient wants so good question so uh, quality of life uh, j cox study did you look in look into quality of life of patients um yeah uh, they go study that uh, don't uh investigate the uh, qol i see so it's or, not in, in yeah. the, the protocol how about how about hans carol four did you look yeah at we are we are going to analyze this and i do agree that it is uh, that it might be a good point for um let's say stoma free survival uh, yeah. as an end point uh in these uh, trials um although there are some international differences i always uh, feel that in, in in the netherlands the care for patients with a stoma is so very well organized that uh, a lot of patients they sometimes prefer a, a stoma instead of going to the toilet uh, 10 times a day so um uh, this is also uh, something you need to discuss with your patient and uh, and uh, and it's a, it's a shared uh, decision making i guess but a good point i mean this is something we need to analyze as well Yep, talking about, you know, patients, perspectives, you know. Um, Hans also mentioned about difficulty in, you know, uh, recruiting patients and also getting informed consent, right? So in particular, when you uh, tell the patient either you do a surgery or not a surgery, so most would prefer not to undergo surgery, am I correct? Or they prefer to, to, to undergo surgery. So patient's perspective. Well, th this can, I mean, this can be uh, uh, both uh, both ways uh, because there are some patients that really prefer uh, the removal of their tumor uh, because they think there's a large tumor and all these cancer cells and perhaps they have some complaints that they don't tell you so they want to uh, a removal of the primary tumor but on the other hand there's also a group of patients who really prefer the chemotherapy because they are afraid of the surgery because they i mean we have to tell them that that there is a higher risk of mortality in this group of patients compared to patients who are uh, stage 1 to 3 so uh, um, uh, there are patients who um, really want to start with chemotherapy. And this is one of the big, big problems of our, our study that, that, that patients uh, did not want to uh, uh, be recruited and they had a preference in the treatment. And there's also doctors who have their dogmas and their uh, uh, preferences. Um, so if I had to do it again, I would actually start with chemotherapy as a primary uh, 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 point of treatment and then randomize after three courses or four courses or whatsoever. So then you lose all the patients who are progressive uh, after three courses of chemotherapy. So the really bad group uh, is not in your trial and then you can randomize for primary tumor resection, yes or no. But I wonder if that's still viable to do this trial because we have so many data in a couple of years from all the different trials that ended. So, um, True. but I, no. we had to do it differently. True. So I now, think, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Uh, sorry, Hans has brought an important point here that uh, do we believe that patients with stage four cancers in comparison to stage one, two, and three have higher morbidity and mortality, surgical morbidity and mortality, and any reasons for that? Uh, or is it that we are, if there is a mortality or morbidity, then we will delay the chemotherapy treatment. What is the ex actual reason why we do not want to resect? Well, we do have higher um, mortality in the stage four patients in our uh, uh, national cancer registry. 
so for uh, colon and rectum patients, it's uh, below 2% for the stage one to three, and it's about 4% in the stage four patients. So it is, it is higher, it is still higher. I mean, it's not huge, but it is, it is more. Um, and I also think that in a substantial group of patients, you, they will not do a primary anastomosis in, in the stage four patients, but uh, give a patient uh, a, a colostomy uh, quite faster than, than, than in the stage one to three patients. I see. Well, so, that, that is a matter of debate uh, to give a colostomy. Unless patient has like uh, nutritional issues, patient is cachectic or, you know, other um, problems that you do not want to anastomose. But if patient is in decent health, um, um, I, I think doing an anastomosis is, is what we should uh, look out for because we do not want to give a stoma and uh, decrease the quality of life for the patient. That's true. So, so now um, we, we're almost coming to the end because, and since we're mentioning about, you know, functional outcomes, uh, functional outcomes, but I think, um, so FIFO is uh, still the most important endpoint in most of the clinical trials. And after all, uh, the reason why, you know, people are saying you should do, you know, primary tumor resection is that it may confer some survival benefit, you know, that's from retrospective studies and also meta-analysis. But right now we have RCTs, all right? But if you look at uh, the Japanese study, it's um, unable to show any survival difference. Korean studies, I think um, you were able to show some slight benefit in cancer-specific survival, but also no difference in overall survival, right? Yeah, but well, I'm not sure about chiral 4, but um, your guess would be, can, can you have a guess? I mean, <laughs> Hans, about the, uh, the, 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 the primary outcome. Do you think you'll be able well, to- Well, when we, when we started this trial, we, um, we always said that primary tumor resection perhaps leads to a better overall survival. But I think it's, and this is a semantic uh, uh, discussion, but I think it's differently, personally, I think it's differently, that patients who still have their primary tumor in perhaps have a worse survival. If you compare it to the whole group of patients with uh, a met metastatic disease. Um, so I believe that on the long term, there are some patients with complaints and then they, they come for a emergency resection or something like that. But there's also patients who progress and they do have symptoms, but then they are in their third line of chemotherapy and then they go for palliative care. And, and perhaps, so this is my guess, that if there is a survival difference, it's gonna be on the long term that the, the curves are going to separate in the advantage of the primary tumor resection. So this might be something that we find in the CARO4, and I don't know the answer. So uh, I, I still have to wait for that for a couple of uh, more uh, months and maybe a year. Yeah, so we are all looking forward to the final results of the CARO4 studies, okay? So with that, I think I'm going to end this panel discussion. So I would like to thank uh, all the speakers and panelists and also uh, my co-moderator, Farood, okay? So um, thank you very much, everyone, for, um, for listening, all right? and then we'll move on to the uh, next session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sue Blackwell and I'm the patient co-chief investigator of the PROFER study. And uh, good morning, my name's Tom Pinkney. I'm a surgeon in Birmingham um, and I'm the chair of the ESCP cohort committee and I'm the other chief investigator uh, of the PROFER study. Uh, in this presentation, Sue's going to take you through some of the background as to why we're doing PROFER and the patient perspective, and then I'll take over and talk a bit about the mechanics of the study itself. So over to you, Sue. Thanks, Tom. So a little bit of background first about parastomal hernia. Um, you know, uh, the figures we have here are from the United Kingdom, so uh, we believe it's quite difficult to find out, but there are around 100,000 people in the UK living with a stoma, and we create approximately 20,000 new stomas a year. And of those, around 50% will be permanent. Um, we do know that there's a lifelong risk of peristomal hernia formation. Uh, it's 30% by 12 months, as you can see, but over 50% of patients who have a longer term follow-up will be shown to have developed peristomal hernia. So the management of peristomal hernia, 
Currently, well, there's two main ways to manage a parasomal hernia. That's conservative treatment. So looking at support garments, losing weight, exercise, and then surgical treatment. And obviously there are lots of different surgical options for um, treating a parasomal hernia. So what do we know? So we know that watchful waiting is the commonest strategy, but obviously there are issues with that because the risks versus the benefit is unknown. We know that parasomal hernias will increase over size, increase in size over time. And then obviously you need more complex surgery if you leave the parasomal hernia too long and it becomes too large. And then with watchful waiting, the biggest issue is when do you operate? At what point do you say, okay, watchful waiting isn't gonna work any longer, we need um, to operate. And then on surgical repair, what we know is that we don't know the best way to repair a parastomal hernia. And you can see on the right there, um, the EHS guidelines on prevention and treatment of parastomal hernia. And you know, we don't know whether lap or open is the best, and we don't know which mesh is the best. And we also don't know um, which type of repair is the best. So while we've been putting profit together, lots of people have asked us, why are you looking at treatment rather than repair? And the thing is, if you just look at repair, you're really only looking at the poor little penguin sitting on top of the iceberg. You're not looking at what's happening under the surface of the water. And repair, it would be much easier just to run a study that looks at repair. But actually, if you look at treatment, you get the whole world data from the, pa the cohort of patients that are living with a parastomal hernia, rather than just those that go on to have a surgical repair. So when you look at the assessment of the outcomes of parastomal hernia treatment, who do we believe? So commonly at the moment, it is the surgeon's assessment of the stoma site. You have your parastomal hernia repair, you go back to clinic, you see the surgeon and the surgeon has a look and says, oh, well, all looks fine, off you go. And then you have the radiological investigation. So you, know, you have a CT scan, what does that show? Now, the problem with, the C with having a CT scan is it might show that the parastomal hernia has recurred, but the patient may not have any symptoms. So which leads us on to the patient reported outcomes of their parastomal hernia treatment, because as I've just said, if you have a CT and it shows that the parastomal hernia repair has failed and the hernia has recurred, but the patient has no symptoms, then for the patient, that's the best outcome that they could possibly have. However, you know, if you looked at it the other way and the hernia hasn't recurred, but the patient still has a lot of symptoms, then that's something that needs to be looked at. And you can't just go on while well, the CT says this, but because the patient has specific symptoms and issues with their quality of life. So this is why, um, and Tom will come on to it, why patient reported outcomes are so important in PROFER. And then you have to look at which outcomes. So this is a summary of the recent parastomal hernia studies that have happened. And if you look at those, only two of those had um, patient reported outcomes. And both of those were pain scores, which are not really that helpful when you're looking at um, the outcomes of parastomal hernia treatment. And when you look at the ones that had quality of life, they were using quality of life scores that don't really reflect what living with a parastomal hernia is like. One of them is the generic stoma qual and one of them was EQ5D. So they're not that, the outcomes that have been used previously are not that useful in establishing what really happens for the patient when they have parastomal hernia treatment. And then obviously here's an example of Stomaqual. It's a great uh, quality of life questionnaire if you want to find out what somebody thinks about living with a stoma, but none of the questions there really have any impact on what life is like with a parastomal hernia. And you can score really high on that, but that would be because you don't like living with your stoma. It has nothing to do with whether or not you have a parastomal hernia. And EQ5D is used a lot, but it's great for measuring health economics, but it's really not suitable measuring quality of life after parastomal hernia treatment. So in 2018, the Association of Coloproctology, um, Great Britain and Ireland, um, released um, some guidelines. And in that, the recommendation was that further studies on patient reported outcome measures are needed with regards to parastomal hernia surgery. And that's really where PROFA came from. So PROFA is going to be the largest study of parastomal hernia management. It is the first time that patient reported outcomes have been a primary outcome measure in parastomal hernia research. And this is why we're so excited about the study. 
it's going to be the largest prospective evaluation of quality of life and parastomal hernia repair. And we're also going to use novel technology to report patient reported outcomes. So now I'll hand over to Tom um, to explain further about the study. Great, thanks very much, Sue. So yeah, let's just look at proper and then we'll, uh, we'll come back to how we're gonna do it in a second. So one of the key things we're gonna do is audit what currently happens. So how parastomal hernias are managed across the world. So that's looking at the proportion that have an operation, but also importantly, including those who don't and undergo conservative treatment. And obviously there'll be some patients who have conservative treatment at first that doesn't work, that cross over to the surgical group. And we're gonna pick those up as well. So looking at the ones who do undergo surgery, we don't know the current status of, of who does what. We know there's lots of options for how to treat a parastomal hernia, which in surgery tends to mean that none of them are perfect. So we're gonna be looking at what people do surgically. Do they use a mesh? If so, what mesh they put? How do they make the trephine? What layer do they put the mesh in? What proportion end up with a, with a reciting operation? And similar technical details about parastomal hernia interventions. And the ones who have conservative treatment, exactly what does that entail? And then importantly, uh, and this is the first for ESCP, we're going to be looking at patient reported quality of life outcomes. So we're going to uh, ask the patients before or at, at baseline um, what their current quality of life situation is. And then at three months, six months and 12 months to report what's happened. And then we can, the third point, most importantly, put that together. So look for associations between what's been done in the operation, or in, in, in fact, what's also been done conservatively and whether that works from the patient's point of view in terms of quality of life and other reported outcome measures. And we'll go on to those now. So let's just look at who's gonna go into the study. So the next slide, thanks, Sue. So we wanna recruit anyone at your sites who's got a parastomal hernia having active management. We know there are some people with a parastomal hernia that's been there for years, causes them no bother, and uh, they're not undergoing treatment. So these will tend to be symptomatic parastomal hernias that are either on the books already or are coming through as a new referral uh, for intervention. And the stoma care nurse, the SCN, or the surgeon can put patients in, and both are equally important. In some senses, I think that the, the key people to get involved uh, will be the stoma care nurses who know these patients well, who know who's got parastomal hernia problems and who sometimes are the ones who recommend surgical intervention. We want to capture all of those patients prospectively from when the study starts at, at the sites who are adults and have got a bowel stoma. So that's colostomies and ileostomies, loops and ends and every other variation. We'd like to have them all uh, on the premise that if you're considering treatment for a parastomal hernia and it's a loop ileostomy, which is unusual, but it's, you know, that there's probably a situation downstream whereby that, that loop ileostomy is going to stay with the patient. So we, we want to include all of these patients uh, and as we've said already, we, we want ones who are not undergoing surgery or adding to a waiting list now, but maybe going on one in the future, or patients who are having conservative treatment. How are we going to do this? So we know from ESCP projects since 2015 that we've got a great network, not only across Europe, as that picture suggests, but across the world of surgeons and trainees and clinicians who are very good at giving us detailed information on what they're doing surgically. So that's the same as our other audits. We'll get basic information on the patient, on the pathology, on the previous surgery, and on the, you know, the reason for a stoma and maybe previous treatment attempts for a parastomal hernia uh, from the surgeon. And then importantly, uh, the surgeon or the nurse will tell us what they're doing for that patient. So in the ones who are having an operation, it will be exactly what they do. And again, we know that, uh, that uh, surgical colleagues across the world are good at this. They will be able to tell us about those questions on the mesh and the size and the plane and how they've done very uh, descriptive things within the operation itself to try and treat this parastomal hernia. And similarly, just like all of the other audits, they'll give us short term outcomes. So that's length of stay, unplanned uh, complications, you know, admissions to ITU, readmissions up to 30 days. Um, and that will be essentially the same as all the other audits we've done through ESCP, looking at right hemicolectomy and stoma reversal and, and rectal surgery that we've had great participation in over the years and the most recent one, which was on acute colitis, as you know. And then, then it gets interesting because then the added bit is, is what happens after that. So the patients themselves um, will give at study entry consent to be 
contacted using online technology through a mobile phone app um, to be contacted to, to really give all the outcomes. So after 30 days, it all uh, comes from the patient themselves. So that's longer term outcomes, did it work or not? Um, and we'll come on to some of the other outcomes we, we, we've added in, but satisfaction, quality of life, and also things like readmission to hospital. You know, if you ask the clinicians that, they have to pull through notes, and sometimes if they get readmitted somewhere else for a, an acute intervention, um, it will be lost. Um, but the patients know very well if they've had further surgery or further admissions to hospitals. So we're just going to ask the patients and essentially bypass the clinicians thereafter. So the next slide is a table kind of highlighting that relationship. So the top part, clinician reported in grey, all the things I've talked about from the baseline to the intervention to the 30 day outcomes. And then um, that's it. The patient then gives us the follow up to uh, first 12 months. We recognize it would be nice to follow these patients up for longer to 24 months or even five years. And that may be um, part of where we go afterwards if we can show that the system works off of this directly patient reported um, intervention. So um, this is record, this will be uh, given to us using an app based system from the, the company. You can see the Aparito. And, and this has been the trickiest part of the study, getting around the governance issues, around the consent issues, around the anonymizing data uh, to allow this to happen um, on a global setting. But the methodology, whilst it's been tricky to get sorted, I think we've nailed it now. And if this works, there are clearly other opportunities and uh, other types of studies that could use a very similar uh, system going forwards. So in terms of data flow, because this is a key point, uh, the next slide shows, um, kind of the mechanics behind the scenes. So if we look at the box at the bottom first, the individual site, surgeons, stoma care nurses, trainees will identify appropriate patients, talk to them about the study um, and, and, and discuss what it involves and, and why it's key that we uh, include them in the research, but also have their data uh, out to 12 months at first. And they'll essentially register the patient on our red cap system, just like the other studies uh, using similar systems um, as we've had before. And then that uh, red cap registration creates a unique ID code. So this, this has to all be anonymous. We can't in uh, the central reporting um, uh, office know who the patients are. We don't want any contact details. We don't want to centralize patient level data uh, that's identifiable, but we do want those directly patient reported outcomes. And the, uh, the, the key thing is this unique red cap identifier, which will have a and a hospital code, a country code, and a patient level code, uh, which then um, gets uploaded into the Aparito system. And all of the consent is provided through the online system. And that's why uh, we're very keen to have this, this great uh, company working with us because they have expertise in how to do this international remote consent in the patient's own language. And the information sheet and the agreement to be involved in the study will all happen on the mobile phone through that system. Um, now that will effectively be a bit like when you update your phone and it, and it sends you some terms and conditions which you have to read and click and either tick in a box with your finger or sign with a finger on the screen to accept and give consent. And that consent is to be contacted by the app with push notifications to, to find out how the patient's doing. Um, and for that data to be anonymously centralized back into our REDCap database, uh, which you can see at the top left. And by using that unique REDCap ID code, we behind the scenes link what the hospital tells us about the patient and the treatment with what the patient tells us about whether it worked or not. Uh, as I say, it's, it's, been a, it's been a challenge to get to this point, but I think we've nailed it now. So next slide, please, Sue. This is how it'll look from the patient's point of view. We've, uh, we've mocked these screens up, but essentially uh, it'll be, uh, as we've said, phone or app based. There will be an option where we think for the patient to do it via email, um, but the, we, we're very keen that we centrally have no identifiers um, held about the patient whatsoever. And that gets around a lot of international data transfer issues. So on the next slide, we can just talk a bit about what we're gonna ask the patients because interacting with the patients directly gives us some opportunities to do something really novel for a surgical trial. So we've got quality of life as we've talked about at baseline and then uh, at, the, at the outcome points. And then the Stoma Impact Score is a new quality of life uh, tool that's been developed by our friends and colleagues in Denmark who are involved in this study. And that does incorporate parastomal hernia as a key factor uh, within that scoring system. And that will give us uh, um, some specific outcome measures relating to that. 
Um, but then we've also got some satisfaction measures and we've got one called Measure Yourself Medical Outcomes Profile, which is a new way of doing an, an outcome, which has been around for some time in other types of research, but not really in this surgical realm. And this is the, is the concept that everyone is different and patients will have different symptoms at baseline that they want to get fixed by going down this treatment pathway. Um, not everyone has the same symptoms as every other patient with a parastomal hernia. So with a measure yourself outcome profile at the beginning, you state your own primary outcome or your own outcome that you want uh, to, to, to achieve and you score it at the beginning. And it could be being able to ride a bike, being able to eat pizza, being able to wear that particular dress, being able to do something, wear something, have something, uh, get rid of a symptom. Um, it doesn't matter. It's personalized and it's individual. And then the system is clever enough to represent that personalized outcome at the end, 12 months later, and find out whether the, the, the treatment has achieved that. So it could have failed on other traditional measures of success, but actually if it achieves that personalized outcome, I would argue that's been a good result for the patient. And then importantly, we're also gonna look at decisional regret. This is the concept that uh, will patients, you know, in retrospect, wish they hadn't gone down this treatment line. That could be wishing that they'd had surgery sooner or that they hadn't had surgery at all. You can see examples of those questionnaires on here. So the, the MIMOP is on the left where you, uh, you create your own outcomes, as we've said. And then on the right, uh, these, uh, the, the five decisional regret questions, which I think will be really interesting with lots of patients anecdotally with parastomal hernia treatment, tell us you know, if they'd known what it was gonna be like and that they were gonna have subsequent operation after operation, they may have just lived with their original symptoms. So we're gonna also assess that in this context. And that all happens automatically personalized on the app. So that's essentially it. We've got a great steering committee, which has got uh, members from the ESCP, but importantly, this is a tripartite project and we've got um, uh, external experts from America and Australia as well, helping us create the study to the point we've got it today. And the final slide here is, is the contact details. We've got uh, 85 or so sites already signed up to get involved in the study. We will be going live in the next, I hope, month or two in the English language, and then we'll roll out to other languages uh, soon thereafter through the, uh, through the online system. If the pilot phase works uh, and we can show that surgeons and clinicians and nurses will engage, and most importantly, patients will engage and do this and engage uh, with centralizing their, their, uh, their outcomes, uh, then we'll roll out globally, we hope, later on this year. That's it for now, I think. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll be delighted to answer any questions. Uh, uh, you can contact us via social media. You can see there via Twitter as well. Thank you. Hello, it is a huge pleasure to uh, update you on the uh, fantastic EGLE study that's run by the European Society of Paleoproctology with partners across the world. The EGLE study is really a world first. And we are really keen that you and your teams look at joining this study. The study is seeking to improve the performance of right-sided bowel anastomosis and to prevent and reduce the incidence of anastomotic leaks. There are already nearly 200 hospitals participating in this study. Please look at joining us. The study is actually based on data that was raised by the ESCP collaborators. And this showed a remarkably high leak rate of 8% of either intra-abdominal collection or leak rate in uh, thousands of patients that we prospectively collected. And also showed a mortality in this population of nearly 3%. Of 3%. What you might not know is that if you do have a leak or an intra-abdominal collection, it increases the mortality by fivefold. So it's not just the quality of patient's life and the prolonged recovery, it's actually their survival that's at risk. I think this is the biggest challenge facing colorectal surgeons today, and I'd like you to work with us to improve it. Uh, we don't know why anastomotic, anastomosis leak, but we know that it's probably multifactorial. It's probably to do with selecting the wrong patients. It's about experience and training for the surgeons. It's about technology issues and using technology properly. And what we did see is a huge variation in practice. So what we want is for surgeons to work together and learn, to, uh, learn from each other. So the Eagle study 
looked at the snapshot audit carried out by the ESCP, and it showed huge variation in outcome in terms of anastomotic leak, and it showed huge variation in practice. And those two things together, we thought we need to change this. We asked the question, can surgeons learn from each other? And we developed this concept of harmonizing clinical practice by working together. We also wanted to say, can we demonstrate a benefit from a change in practice? And this means we need a clinical trial. And the clinical trial is EGLE. It is a really unusual design. No surgical trial has ever been undertaken with this design. And I'm just showing you here how it works. The hospitals, not the patients, the hospitals are randomized into sequence one, sequence two, or sequence three, shown on the left-hand side here. And in sequence one, the intervention, the training tool is done first, then the data is collected. For hospitals in sequence two, they collect data on patients undergoing right-sided bowel resection and then do the intervention and then collect data again. And in sequence three, they just collect data before doing the intervention. What this means is it stops bias about learning over time. And it's actually comparing outcomes in sequence one against sequence two against sequence three. And this is a really efficient and clever design. We believe it's a design for a study that can be used in many future trials. The intervention that we're using is a high quality interactive online platform. It has videos, it has operations, it has fireside discussions, it has training discussions. And it takes about maybe two to three hours to go through the whole of the online training. Uh, it's actually CPD accredited from the Royal College of Surgeons. You don't have to do it all at once. It's a modular structure with five modules, and it focuses on the multidisciplinary team all being involved in decision making. It supports and develops decision making for surgeons. And it should be of interest for any colorectal surgeon, any senior or trainee surgeon, and junior surgeons. We are, they are all welcome to undertake the intervention, and we will provide logins for them to do that. Everyone who takes part in the study can undergo the, it can undertake the intervention. And as we're seeking to harmonize practice across the hospitals and across international borders. There are five modules, as I described. There's a teaching surgeons about risk stratifying patients to identify that small group of patients at very high risk of leak, mainly patients that shouldn't have an anastomosis. It also introduces a new concept of a safe anastomosis checklist undertaken in theatre by the whole theatre team, like the WHO checklist we all undertake before surgery. It also talks about preparing for the anastomosis, about how to undertake stapled anastomosis and hand sewn anastomosis. But most importantly of all, it's about surgeons learning from each other. We think the Eagle model is something that we're going to use in many trials going forward. We want you to join the teams to do this in the future. There are other studies of anastomotic technique we need to undertake. We're currently co completing studies on using circular devices, circular statement devices, and looking at variation in outcomes and practice. Uh, there are new devices coming through, and there's a couple of interesting studies just out in the last year looking at the use of um, powered staple devices. And this actually seems to show that if we improve the devices and train people properly to use them, we can have a huge reduction in leak rates. So it's a very exciting uh, development. In addition, we can use it for other aspects of surgical practice. We're actually developing a new study now called Giraffe. And next year, we'll be launching this study. And this is to train surgeons about selecting patients and looking after patients undergoing emergency laparotomy. This is a very high mortality procedure across the whole world and something we're sure we could improve on. But first, let's complete Eagle and show the world how we can work together. The aim of the study is to reduce the leak rate from right-sided anastomosis by 30%, from 8.1 to 5.6%. This is a hugely ambitious target. The inclusion criteria are really simple. Any patient who you're planning to undertake a right-sided bowel resection, 
And we want you to include patients who decide not to anastomose as well as those who decide to anastomose. The exclusions are really only patients where you're undertaking other procedures like HIPEC, like a liver resection, like multiple stricturoplasties, where the right-sided bowel anastomosis uh, is only a small part of the whole operation. All the rest of the patients undergoing right-sided bowel resections are included. The primary outcome is a, com is a composite outcome of, to reduce anastomotic leak rate, and that is either gross evidence of radiological, of, of leak clinical or radiological, or the presence of an intraperitoneal abscess or fluid collection on imaging. Secondary outcomes of mortality and change in rate of stable formation, because we want to look at how you're selecting patients for anastomosis. Already 181 sites have been randomized, and we want you to join these hospitals and become part of the Eagle team. These sites, there are nearly 300 hospitals across the world, shown here on the left, uh, that have joined the Eagle study, and 181 of them have already been randomized. Across the world, we have a network in India, and only two weeks ago, we carried out a, a webinar just for our Indian network, about 12 hospitals across India joined us on that uh, call, about 50 doctors and colleagues. And we had a really interesting discussion about Eagle and other studies. We now have a big network in Malaysia and eight of those hospitals in Malaysia have already been randomized in the trial. And Mohammed El Shami has actually developed a Middle East uh, network, which has just been launched and just been started. It even includes hospitals from Syria and Aleppo. So it's a really exciting worldwide community. If you want to start a national network in your country and you want to provide leadership, we'll support you and we will do a webinar with your network and help bring them into our research community. We want you to join in these studies, not just now, but going forward for the future. Already we have a thousand patients have been entered into the Eagle study. Uh, over 600 surgeons have already completed online training and over a thousand logins have been handed out. So many thousands of surgeons are going to do this training online together and learn from each other. Please join us. Please join the Eagle study. I look forward to seeing you soon and collaborating with you in the future. This, uh, this give, gives you, guides you to the online website where you can join the study and register. Thank you very much. So good morning and good evening, depending where you are in the world. And uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, listening to our uh, panel discussion today. We are very fortunate to have um, uh, four distinguished uh, panelists. And um, let me introduce uh, all the panelists. Um, firstly, uh, we have uh, Professor Peter Christensen. He is a uh, professor of uh, colorectal surgery in the pelvic floor unit at the Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark, and uh, currently the Communications Committee Chair of the ESCP, and, and a very active member of the Global Reach uh, Committee. And um, we also have um, uh, Professor April Roslani. She is uh, currently the consultant colorectal surgeon and professor of surgery, and the Dean of the uh, Faculty of Medicine at the at uh, University of Malay Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She's also the president of the College of Surgeons Malaysia. And uh, her center is uh, one of the uh, newest uh, or the newer centers who have joined in, in the EGLE study. So we are very delighted to have uh, her here today. And, and um, of course, um, we also have uh, two of our lead uh, investigators for the two studies that was just uh, um, presented earlier, uh, Professor Dion Morton. He is the uh, Professor of Surgery and the Head of Academic Department at the University of Birmingham and currently the Co-Chair of the ESCP Global Reach Committee and the uh, uh, Lead Investigator for the EGLE trial. And Professor Thomas uh, Pinckney, thank you very much for coming. Uh, he is also a Professor and the Director of the Birmingham Surgical Trials Consortium and um, currently the Vice Chair of the Research Committee of the of uh, ESCP and the uh, uh, key investigator for the proper trial. So thank you very much once again for coming. And um, perhaps um, I can start the, the questions with something very um, general. Um, 
with regards to the Eagle trial, uh, Professor uh, Morton, um, now that the trial is ongoing uh, and with regards to uh, the current situation of, of, of the pandemic COVID-19, do you see um, uh, any effects or any striking differences in how the uh, results and how the study is run? It's been hugely challenging for many of our investigators around the world. And as the pandemic has reached different countries, uh, their health services, we've seen how they've come under strain. But it's been fantastic to see how the surgeons around the world have responded. And the Eagle trial uh, stopped for three months last year. We had to stop between uh, April and August last year, but we were able to restart in September. And since September, really everyone has worked very hard to keep the trial going. And that's why we've been able to enter 149 different hospitals from nearly 50 countries around the world. It's been quite a remarkable achievement and a great testimony to uh, the surgeons around the world taking part in the trial. Thank you. Yeah. So following up on that, because um, I'm from Malaysia and we have Professor April here too, who is, uh, whose centre is one of the uh, centres, the only centre in my country who has joined the Eagle trial. And perhaps uh, Prof. April could uh, shed some light on um, how the trial is running there and are there any challenges that you're facing uh, with regards to the trial? Um, thanks very much, Lokman. Um, to say that we faced uh, a few challenges would be understating it a bit. Um, and uh, as you've rightly noted, um, ours is the only hospital enrolled at the moment. But in fact, we had identified more than uh, 10 hospitals that were interested. And one of the roadblocks that we faced um, was actually ethical approval. Because of the novel design of the study, um, the uh, national um, uh, MREC, um, you know, couldn't quite wrap their heads around it. Um, the reason my hospital was able to uh, uh, participate is because we have our own um, internal review board. Uh, and that's that's accepted um, as uh, uh, approval. Um, however, um, I'm, I'm happy to note that we've managed to negotiate and, and find our way around the, the national uh, MREC. I think the last sticking point was that they wanted um, a signed agreement between ourselves and the um, steering committee um, with regards to uh, patient data uh, confidentiality. And so that, that step has been completed. And so we hope that um, very soon we'll be able to bring in a few more hospitals. Uh, with regard to my own hospital, um, the obstacle we faced is um, the impact of managing uh, COVID-19 cases. Um, so as, as you may be aware, we are what's termed as a hybrid hospital. Um, and so we manage both COVID as well as non-COVID cases. Um, and that's required us to have quite a flexible and fluid response to um, the uh, rise and fall of uh, patient numbers. You know, and that's impacted actually our volume of elective cases, uh, including cancer cases. So I think that's, that's what's actually um, uh, impeded our uh, recruitment of um, patients to this study. Are there, in, and this question goes for both studies, are there certain countries or continents that are keen to participate? And if so, if there's anything we can learn to enthusiasm more centers for future studies? I don't know, maybe Tom would like to comment on that. So we've got um, a wide level of interest in proper across the world. Um, at the moment, uh, we are, one of our challenges, one of the expensive bits of our really clever patient interface is the, is the professional translation. So the pilot phase is starting in a few particular languages, but of course, if you pick the right languages, that can open up a large part of the world, for example, Spanish, French, um, in addition to English. Um, and we've got great buy-in from our collaborators across the tripartite nation, so Australasia and America, to, to be involved. And what I hope is that we'll demonstrate with the pilot phase that, that this you know, is attractive and doable both from a clinical and a patient point of view, and then we can roll out in the main study to every language, um, including those across the Far East and uh, Southern America, for example.
So um, when, when would the profit trial uh, begin? And are there any challenges uh, currently before, I mean, right now, just prior to it being uh, launched? Yes, I mean, the, the, the hardest bit has been uh, around data governance consent, international transfer of patient level data. And uh, you may have already heard about profit more than once over the last year or two. And that, that's been really because we've been finalizing those bits and working to find the right interface uh, with patients uh, that satisfies the data guardians and the governance requirements uh, and the ethical boards across the world. And we've, we've, we've finally got there now. We're pretty happy with our solution and the, the kind of consent flow. Um, so we are pleased that the pilot's going to launch this summer um, with a view to, to running for about six months or so. And then um, I'm confident that, that the clinicians will engage with it based on previous conversations and Remember, we are, we are adopting a tried and tested method of having the clinicians across the world tell us the technical details about the patient, the intervention, and their short-term outcomes. They've done that brilliantly over the past few years with our ESCP projects. And the only additional bit is bolting on the patient reported outcomes. Um, but we, by having the central PPI and, and patient involvement in the design and the running of the study with Sue, and Sue's leading the study with me, as you know, um, we are, you know, we've spoken to a lot of patients about what they want from this study and uh, how to engage with them successfully. I'm pretty confident that, that they will um, engage with it um, and they may, even in some countries, be the ones who are um, getting their clinicians involved in, in, in uploading their data to the study in order that they can be followed up and provide their own information um, as to how well their intervention or conservative treatment works for their parastomal hernia. Peter, you want to say something, Peter? We look very much forward to see the start of this trial, Tom. Um, um, can you do, have, do you have some recommendation if a new country wants to, uh, to go on board with the, with the study, how to solve these legal issues that might be? Do you have any standard uh, um, uh, formats or something that we can stick to? Or, or how do you manage this in a practical way? So um, we're working on it, Peter. I think we know from our audits that some countries already um, need patient level consent just to centralize their data, just for their surgeon to tell us what the operation was and how it went. And in those countries where we've, where we've, it's been harder historically, we think adding the patient reported outcomes because they're already getting patient level consent won't be a lot extra. So actually, I think countries like Spain and Turkey that have done brilliantly in those studies should actually be able to do this one even easier than, than, than others. In the UK, where the audit approval pathway has been fine for our historical studies, in this one, it's actually a bit more work because we have to get patient level consent and it has to go through all the usual ethics boards. And I think if we've learned anything over the last few years of global studies with ESCP and other projects, it's, um, it's the country level coordinators and country level uh, specific IRB approvals or ethics approvals. Once you tend to get one hospital through, it, it somewhat opens the floodgates in most countries and others will, uh, will then be much easier to get through. So it's, it's getting someone who's keen and willing to help us um, spend some time getting their unit open and then it will be a kind of greater good of, of all of their colleagues around the region and even the country We'll have a much easier time and that's the, that's the model we hope to emulate just like eagle i think it's really important to emphasize that one of the great things about the escp research groups is the experience they have in helping governance around the world and getting through ethics committees and coordinating research and we tap into that experience to lead new trials and the other thing that we've started is this having a national lead and a coordinator for trials and April has, of course, been a fantastic leader for the, for the network in Malaysia to support uh, the uh, EAGLE trial. And we have got coordinators in all the different countries we're working in and that we can share experience to move these projects forward. It's really the whole project of research in ESCP is a shared project that we learn from each other and we work together. It's a really exciting uh, adventure. Thank you. So uh, patient-reported uh, patient outcomes, will that uh, 
should we always aim to include these outcomes in future surgical trials? What do you think, April? No, I absolutely agree. Um, I think we've spent um, a long time um, just thinking about outcomes from the perspective of the surgeon or the anesthetist, you know, the, the, the healthcare professionals. And of course, we, we do um, consider uh, outcomes that have impact on the patients, you know, mortality, morbidity, but, but really it's still from the perspective of what we think is important to the patient. So I absolutely agree that uh, patient reported outcomes should be a standard part of um, uh, the outcomes of any intervention um, in, in, in healthcare. Uh, even for something like fistulas, for instance, you know, we tend to think of it in absolute terms, it's healed or it hasn't healed. Uh, but really what we should be looking at is the patient's quality of life. Has it been improved by our intervention? And so, you know, even if it hasn't healed completely, or they might be better off, as opposed to it being healed, but they're left functionally worse. So, so yes, I agree with that. I think April's absolutely right. And uh, the, the big thing in surgical studies is that historically, we've tended to use very short follow-up, 30 days in hospital, because we're looking at early outcomes. But with chronic conditions like parastomal hernia, like fistulas that April was talking about, really we want to have longer follow-up. And longer follow-up means follow-up in the community. And so using patient reported outcomes is a fantastic tool for surgeons to find out more about the outcomes from their work. So it's a, I think it's a huge advance. And the PROFER study is a world first in doing this in surgery. So it's a really exciting adventure. I think it's really important also that we're involving um, patients in research about matters that impact them, um, you know, over the course of their lifetime. And I think it's really exciting. I, I just um, am a little uh, hesitant about how we're going to get it through if we're going to do this in, in Malaysia, because I, I, our legal framework in terms of uh, patient data sharing when it comes to these sorts of platforms is still um, at the developmental stage. So I think we may face some challenges there. Uh, but you know how there's, there's opportunity in adversity. So somehow the pandemic has pushed that discussion along much, much uh, faster than it would otherwise have gone. Peter? <clears throat> the use of uh, pro uh, patient reported outcomes also uh, make it possible to collect uh, larger patient series across countries like uh, we uh, do in these um, uh, uh, European uh, trials uh, and uh, it, um, it carry some great perspectives in, in other uh, trial settings as well. Uh, but we, we, we need to to focus on, on the standardization of these uh, outcome measures that we are using. And uh, I think uh, there has been a, a great process and a very uh, safe process within the proper study trying to collect those um, uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, and you have even taken all, uh, it all the way that you also now uh, uh, not um, that you use uh, a tool called MyMop. Uh, could you explain a little bit about this uh, uh, instrument, Tom? Yes, so not content with trying to redesign the whole way we do the research, we thought it would be interesting to, to adopt this into a surgical trial and, and it's recognition, so this is MyMop is Measure Yourself Medical Outcomes Profile, which is not new, been around in some rheumatology trials and uh, other types of chronic disease research for 15 or 20 years. But we thought it'd be interesting to try and adopt this as one of our of secondary outcome measures um, to, to, to look at. And it's a recognition that people's parastomal hernias affect them all very differently. So for all the reasons we've heard about, we are keen to, to get the patients to tell us whether their surgery worked or not, how satisfied they are with it, and also a decisional regret. Lots of patients have told us had they known about their parastomal hernia repair journey, they may not have had the first operation, and then not the second one, then not the stoma moving to the other side, and so on. So 
I think some of those other things are also quite novel and new. But the MyMOP recognizes that the aim of treatment for one patient will not be the same as the next. So by, by asking the patient what they hope to achieve um, and then asking them a year later if they did achieve it or not, you're really personalizing the study to them. You're not fitting their symptoms in some pre-ascribed four main categories, for example, and, and it's pretext. So it could really be wearing that particular dress. It could be eating pizza. It could be riding a bike. It could be whatever they want to achieve by having their parastomal hernia dealt with surgically or with conservative therapy. And then we can go back to them. And by standardizing it in, in, into a scoring system, we can statistically assess those, those success rates. But it's clearly a bit more messy than using a standardized validated scoring system, um, which, is, uh, which is the more traditional way of doing it. So again, it's, a, it, it's something we're trying here, and I think it will have great future use in surgery. But like the whole study um, is, is somewhat of a, uh, it's gonna be a hurdle setting it up, but I think it will open the floodgates to loads of other studies where we can link together consultant or clinician reported data with patient reported outcomes. It's a, it's a methodology we're really excited about. So we're, we're running out of time. So in the interest of time, should we, could we ask um, uh, any one of the panelists to have um, do, uh, uh, a comment on the unique methodology of these two studies? And this, that would be the final comment, I think. I think the Eagle study is, is really exciting because it allows us to properly evaluate learning and training interventions and to generate results very quickly. I'm just writing up a study that I started 10 years ago. And I think that is really sad that uh, it takes so long to finish a study. The Eagle study, we're going to try and finish it in a year write up the results and come back with a new study, Eagle 2, Eagle 3, Eagle 4. So I think it's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, in terms of proffer, uh, we using patients or getting patients involved in designing the studies they want to see and the outcomes they want to, uh, to, to be assessed is, is really quite novel. And ESCP is lucky to have Sue as a PPI rep on our research and audit committees. And I think we're quite unusual for an international society in colorectal surgery or indeed in most surgery to have patients involved on the research panels helping us with this and all of the studies. Um, and, and that insight um, has, has, I think, strengthened the design of the study. As we've said, this study, you know, it's a really important clinical question um, and it's a really important uh, methodology to get right. And, and I think when we deliver proffer and we learn from it about how to get it open across the world and how to collect this data, um, successfully, there'll be a whole load of follow-up studies. We're already thinking about conditions that would be great to use a similar methodology for in, in, in colorectal surgery and beyond. Thank you very much, all of you, for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. On behalf of the Global Reach Committee, I would like to thank all speakers, panelists, sponsors, and most of all, all attendees for making this fifth Global Reach webinar possible. Today, we have discussed a timely issue for colorectal surgeons, namely how to deal with patients with stage four palliative colorectal cancer. In this lecture, a survey of how to deal with the primary tumor in a palliative setting was presented. This survey was distributed through the ESCP and the other national societies partaking in the global reach. And I would like to thank everyone who took time answering the survey. Today, we have also been updated on two multicenter international trials, the PROFER on parastomal hernias and the EAGLE trial on anastomotic leakage of the right hemicolectomies. And we are hoping that you will get involved in these studies. Particularly in these difficult times, we realize that the world is complex Colorectal diseases are challenging and we need to work together 
to improve treatment and care for colorectal patients. The Global REACH Committee believes that it is possible to build a strong international research collaboration, and that is what we are aiming for. So we encourage you to get involved in the studies you have heard about today and to tune in to our next Global REACH webinar that will be broadcasted June 18th. And at that time, Point, we are hoping to reach out to more continents as well. So finally, I wish you all a good morning or a good night, depending on your location. And with these concluding remarks, I'm hoping to see you all again in June. Thank you. <laughs>